Good morning, everyone. Merry Christmas. Thank you for uh, joining us on Christmas morning, and we hope you've enjoyed some time with your friends and family so far this morning, and I, I promise not to use too much of your time so you can return to them and continue your celebration of Christmas. Uh, jo join me um, in reading a passage I'll be preaching from today in Matthew, Matthew chapter 1. We're going to begin in verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but he knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Lord, thank you for your word. I pray that you would um, open our ears today, open our eyes, use your word to teach us, to call us to you, Lord, to call us into obedience and worship. Uh, just may everything we do honor and glorify you today as we, we celebrate your birth. Just me pray. Amen. I grew up in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, uh, and I went to a big Baptist church there. Every year we put on a Christmas program, included Bible readings, we'd sing worship songs together, we had a drama. We basically walked through the events of Jesus' birth and early life, and I had the opportunity to play a, a shepherd in the drama. I loved acting as a shepherd because the church we get live animals, and we got to carry lambs down the aisle and walk up on stage for a short scene. That was it. One year I got a promotion. I was asked to play Joseph, which I thought was going to be even cooler. Got to be in a few more scenes. It was a bigger role. And all this went straight to my head, and I just accepted it. So, so I show up for rehearsal, walking through everything. The actor's playing Mary. And I walk up the aisle, and we get on stage, and for the first scene, she's wearing a kind of pillow on her stomach to, you know, so she looks pregnant, and everything's going fine up to this point. The second scene is after Jesus is born, and we have a little baby Jesus to hold. And I thought this was going to be a doll. Now, some of you see where this is, this is going, and it turns out we were going to be holding a real-life human baby. <laughs> and I just immediately feel a sense of fear and dread wash over my whole body. And I'm thinking, I'm the lamb guy. You can hold a lamb. You can drop a lamb. You can't drop a baby. But it's too late to back out. I have to go forward with this thing. And the night of the first performance, I, I, it comes up. I, I meet the baby for the first time. And I'm getting all these tips about how to hold it and how not to hold it. And I'm just, you know, I can't even think about anything else. I'm just worried about, you know, what if this baby starts crying? How am I going to comfort this, this child? And it seems very likely that the baby will cry. I mean, why would a baby cry when they're being held by a stranger in weird clothes in front of a couple hundred other strangers while loud music is playing and, you know, there are bright stage lights shining and mom is just nowhere to be found. <laughs> so I'm on stage in a robe, which is basically a dress, holding a baby. Can't think about acting, you know, because all I'm worried about is this child and I'm just praying I won't cry and I'm supposed to show them to the shepherds when they walk up. And I, I basically, I'm just like this, you know, like this is all I can do to show, you know, like, there's no joy. All I can do is just, <laughs> people in the back row can see me sweating, I'm sure. I hope that image and me in robes looking horrified holding a baby doesn't taint your view of me or of Joseph as we read about that today. And why did I share that story? Well, there's, there's two reasons. First is it's probably the second funniest Christmas story about me, and most of you don't know me very well, so I just wanted to introduce myself. And second, I was really struggling to come up with a good introduction for this passage. Nothing in history was like Jesus' birth, and nothing like it has happened since. 
So I have a very tenuous connection. That's basically that in my story and the story that we read in Scripture today, they both have Joseph, and Joseph was afraid. And that's how the passage opens up. Joseph has got a problem. So let's get into the text. We open up, we're in verse 18, um, and we have an interesting situation. Mary and Joseph are betrothed. Mary is pregnant, and we later see that Joseph is just. That's how he's described. So the first thing about we need to look at here is this word betrothed, and we think of this uh, kind of like kind of like engagement, uh, and in broad strokes it is because it's a state of pre-marriage. It's far more serious, though. It's a deeper level of commitment than engagements are in our culture today. There's an aspect of betrothal that's legally binding. You, you see that they're still called husband and wife here. It's almost marriage, except that the man and woman weren't living together and their relationship had not been consummated yet. So Mary being pregnant at this stage is scandalous. The text tells us that Mary and Joseph had not consummated the relationship, so Joseph could reasonably assume that Mary had committed adultery. And Joseph is just, right? He isn't described as just because he tries to divorce her quietly. Actually, the opposite is true. He's just, he tries to divorce her quietly because he is just. He's just because he follows the Mosaic law. If you go to Deuteronomy 22, you know, we see laws about adultery and they're severe. Verses 13 through 21, a man who wrongfully accuses his wife of having previous relations is whipped and fined. But if his accusation is true, she's stoned to death. In verse 22, we see that a couple is caught in the act of adultery. They're both stoned to death. This continues. We get more detailed scenarios in Deuteronomy, and, and basically the ending is always bad. It's always stoned to death. In the case of adultery, according to Mosaic law, that Joseph does follow closely, he's within his rights to have Mary stoned to death. So why doesn't he do that? In chapter 24... Of Deuteronomy, a few chapters later, uh, we're given another circumstance that gives grounds for divorce. It says the man may grant his wife a divorce if he finds some indecency in her. It's purposefully vague, but implies some kind of act short of adultery. This is the option that Joseph, who again is just, he chooses. Not because it is a perfect answer, but it's as close of a situation as he can find in the Old Testament. Surprisingly, there isn't a clause in Old Testament laws regarding virgin birth. It's unprecedented. This means he probably believed Mary, even if he didn't totally understand it. He, he believed that she wasn't an adulteress. The important aspect here is that in choosing to grant her a divorce certificate, Mary would continue to be legally protected in her pregnant state. Had she been found unmarried and pregnant without a certificate, she could have been stoned by anyone else in the community. In this way, Joseph is doing his best to both follow the Mosaic law and protect Mary. Then Joseph has a dream. And in this dream, an angel tells him not to be afraid because the child in Mary is from the Holy Spirit. See, the angel is telling him not to be afraid because he doesn't have to figure out how to deal with this difficult situation from a legal standpoint anyway. His justice is not in conflict with his mercy anymore. He just needs to get married it's not Joseph's problem to solve, but we're kind of looking at this passage thinking, this still doesn't make a lot of sense. What does it mean that that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit? Conceived probably isn't the best word for this. For us, conceived implies the moment an egg is fertilized. I'm going to try to keep it appropriate so I won't belabor these points, but let's put it this way. Conceived is two parts coming together in the womb to make one. At least that's how we usually think of it. And we know, because we've been told twice, that no man contributed to Mary's pregnancy. It was this Holy Spirit's work. We've seen Luke's gospel in chapter 1, verse 35, that the Holy Spirit overshadows Mary, which is supposed to help us recall the action of the Spirit in Genesis 1, creation. Do you remember what the Spirit does then? It's hovering over the waters and imparts life throughout creation. This is how Mary becomes pregnant. Holy Spirit put the child in Mary, a virgin. So instead of two parts coming together in the womb to make one, we get a supernatural pregnancy from the Holy Spirit that uses zero parts to create one. This is important because it lets us hold two things that we know about Jesus without them conflicting with each other. And we always say he's fully God and fully man. 
He's fully man, but he's also sinless. Paul talks in Romans about how we humans have all inherited a sin nature that goes all the way back generations to Adam's original sin. All humanity has fallen. In his birth, Jesus breaks apart from the curse of sin that affects all humanity. One more time. Christ, in his full divinity, he did not give up. He adds to himself full humanity without inheriting the curse of sin. Had Jesus been born of a man and woman, he would have inherited sin. Had he been born of a supernatural fertilization of Mary's egg, he also would have inherited sin. By the Holy Spirit, Jesus is born of a virgin. He adds humanity to his divinity, and that humanity is not marred by sin. Then in the dream, the angel tells Joseph that he's having a son. He'll be named Jesus, and he'll save his people from their sins. We'll come back to this later. We follow down to verse 22 and 23. Matthew tells us that the virgin birth identifies Jesus as Emmanuel. We've sung so many songs today. I, I, I was surprised, but so many of our worship songs around Christmas feature the word Emmanuel. There's two things I'd like to go over in regards to this word. It's meaning and it's significance in this prophecy. And Matthew tells us straight out, Emmanuel means God with us. kind of seems like he really, really wants us to know this. Like when a teacher gets to a point in the lesson and kind of stops and leans into the class and says, this is important. It's going to be on the test. (laughs) And this is important to Matthew. God being with us is a major theme throughout this book, really the whole Bible, but specifically in Matthew. Partly because Jesus is literally God physically with us. Jesus takes on flesh, he becomes like us, and he dwells among us. But in taking on flesh, he did not forfeit his divinity. Jesus is fully God and fully alone. Fully God, fully God, and fully man. This alone is miraculous. But wait, you may be saying. Hasn't God dwelt among his peoples before? They had the tabernacle, where priests would go in to make sacrifices to God, right? It's always complicated. There are veils separating the people from God. The priests had to go through extensive cleansing rituals before they could go and make their sacrifices. Consider Moses, seeing God from the cleft in the rock. It's a great story. Moses Moses has to go stand on a rock, and then God is going to move him to a cleft in the rock, cut off some of his vision. Then when God is passing by, he's going to cover Moses with his hand so he can't see him. Then he passes. Moses can briefly glimpse his back. That's all he's going to be able to see. So yes, God has dwelt among his people, but never the way that Jesus does. The second thing we can learn about Emmanuel is how it fits into this prophecy from Isaiah. Matthew's quoting Isaiah 7.14 word for word here. This prophecy involves more than what Matthew quotes, though. Isaiah uh, continues this prophecy of Emmanuel in later chapters. Specifically, we get to Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, we're all very familiar with. Emmanuel is described as being called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace, Eternal Father. Emmanuel, this prophecy tells us, will reign with justice, righteousness, and peace forever. So let's recap this. Long before Jesus was born, Isaiah prophesied that a virgin would give birth, and the son will be called Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Then this Emmanuel will be called Mighty God, Prince of Peace. He'll have an everlasting kingdom marked by peace and justice. Matthew is telling us that Jesus is this Emmanuel. All of this comes together in Jesus. In the virgin birth, Jesus is taking on flesh, the incarnation. He's adding to his divine nature, human nature. And he's fulfilling this prophecy from Isaiah about Emmanuel, whose name means God with us and who will reign forever. It had to be a virgin birth. The virgin birth is vital to all of these things occurring. But why? What does it matter that all these things have happened? It's cool. What's the point of it all? This is the part I mentioned earlier that we would come back to. The purpose of the virgin birth is stated in verse 21. In this verse, the angel tells Joseph that he will name the child Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this has been leading to salvation. This is why we celebrate Christmas. We celebrate Jesus' birth because in his death, 
all of us can find salvation from sin. How did people miss this back then? I mean, his name is Jesus, which literally means God is salvation. He fulfilled prophecy. As Emmanuel, he literally dwelt among his people. He was performing miracles. He taught amazing things. How did people not understand what he was doing or who he was? Well, it seems like they thought that the prophesied Emmanuel would set up an earthly kingdom. They expected a conqueror king to come down and start taking names. Think about how they mocked Jesus at the crucifixion. Called him king of the Jews, put a crown of thorns on his head. Some king who ended up crucified. If you only catch one thing out of the sermon, I hope it's this. The cross was always part of the plan. Jesus' goal from birth was not to establish an earthly or political kingdom. It was to save his people from their sins. To accomplish that goal, Jesus had to die. Hebrews describes the sacrificial system of the Old Testament. and He says it's purposefully temporary. Chapter 10, it says that it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. The priests were having to continually offer sacrifices to make temporary atonement, but Christ came to make a permanent atonement. One sacrifice that would solve the sin problem for good. It's this point we start to see why Jesus needed to be fully God and fully man. He needed to be man, like us, to stand in our place, to take our punishment for sin. But he needed to be God to bear the weight of that sin. He needed to be born of a virgin to break the passed down curse of sin. And his divine nature allowed him to remain sinless so that he could be pure and a perfect sacrifice on our behalf. And past that, so that he could be the pure and perfect priest to make that sacrifice of himself. The supernatural birth of Christ sets up everything sets up the means for us to receive salvation. As the praise band starts to make their way back up, I'd like to close with this quote from J.I. Packer. The true Christian claim here is that incarnation made direct entry into human frustration and pain possible for the Son of God, who then, out of love, actually entered into person into the agony of crucifixion in the greater agony of God forsakenness, in order to bear our sins and so redeem us. I think there are basically two responses to this that are appropriate. For Christians, good responses to worship. We celebrate Christmas. We remember what Jesus did for us from the cradle to the cross. We should celebrate his becoming like us and worship him for taking what is ours, punishment and giving us what is his, his righteousness. We should consider this miraculous birth and not forget that he was born so that he could later die on our behalf. For any non-Christians here today, I ask you to think of the same things. Sin has broken each one of us. It's marked each one of us. But we have a Savior who has broken sin. All we must do is believe and repent. So we enter in this time of worship, don't Miss an opportunity to thank God for what he's done and to respond to him in repentance and obedience. Thank you.